Hi there, I'm Wes Olszewski once again here with you, Ghost Ships, Gales, and Forgotten Tales. What do you say we get right into it and uh, go on another Great Lakes adventure? Launched on Thursday, April 27th, 1893, at Middlesbrough, England, the Bonnockburn was a 254-foot canal steamer. She was christened by Miss Keith Glenn of Greennook. Bannockburn arrived in Montreal on July 4, 1893, carrying a cargo of coal from Sydney. At Montreal, she was cut in half. This was because she had been designed to fit through the locks of the Welland Canal, but not through the locks along the St. Lawrence River. In two pieces, she left Lachine on Tuesday, August 8, 1893, towed by four tugs. She arrived at Kingston on Sunday, August 13th. She was not dry docked until August 22nd because every ship riveter in the city of Kingston had to be mustered to put her back together. On September 9th, she headed out for her first trip on the Great Lakes, bound for Charlotte, New York, to take on a cargo of coal. On September 10th, the following day, she ran aground entering that port. Reportedly, she was 10 miles off course in clear weather. On September 11th, she departed for Fort William with a cargo of coal. It was reported that she would have, quote, a piece put onto her rudder, unquote, because she was difficult to steer. Thereafter, Bannockburn ran regular trips between the upper lake ports and the lower lake ports, hauling grain down and coal up. Her primary ports were Fort William and Port Arthur to load grain, and Kingston to unload. Often, she towed as many as two schooner barges. On the night of November 20th, 1902, she departed Port Arthur with a reported 85,000 bushels of wheat consigned for Midland, Ontario. On her way out, she grounded, and her departure was delayed until Friday, November 21st. That evening, she was sighted by Captain McGraw of the steamer Algonquin, she was about 50 miles south of Passage Island. A thick haze hung over the lake, and a stiff wind was blowing, but the Bannockburn seemed to be making good weather of it. Captain McGraw went about other business. Later, when he looked again, the Bannockburn was not in sight. It took five full days before concern over the missing Bannockburn was raised. A full week after she went down, the headlines about the missing Bannockburn finally broke across the lakes, much of which was based on rumors. Shortly thereafter, the Bannockburn was given up for lost, and an interesting thing happened. A legend grew that she was now a ghost ship haunting Lake Superior, a flying Dutchman of the lake. In modern times, we often read tales of old-time mariners reporting seeing the ghost ship Bannockburn in the distance on a stormy voyage. In fact, having researched marine news columns in old newspapers for more than 30 years, I have never seen a single published report of any such sighting. So when did this flying Dutchman Bannockburn legend begin? It's a fun question. The first appearance in print seems to come from James Oliver Kerwood's 1910 book, The Great Lakes and the Vessels That Plow Them. In it, he mentions the Bannockburn's disappearance and ends with this statement, And now, by certain superstitious sailors, the Bannockburn is supposed to be the flying Dutchman of the inland seas, and there are those who will tell you in all earnestness, that on icy nights, when the heaven above and the sea below 
were joined in one black pall, they have decried the missing Bannockburn, a ghostly apparition of ice scudding through the gloom. Later, in Dana Thomas Bowen's Lore of the Lakes, published in 1940, he also promotes the Flying Dutchman legend. As does William Radigan in his 1960 book, Great Lakes Shipwrecks. Next, in 1965, Dwight Boyer furthers the legend in his book, Ghost Ships of the Great Lakes. At length, James P. Berry used the Flying Dutchman legend in his 1973 book, Ships of the Great Lakes. It is often implied, and sometimes stated flatly, that the Bannockburn's saltwater, three-island, three-mast configuration was unmistakable by maritime men. So all who claim to have seen it must have seen the Bannockburn herself. Yet the storytellers leave out one small detail. She had an identical twin. The Rosemount. Built to order for the same Montreal Transportation Company who also ordered the Bannockburn, the Rosemount ran the same routes as the Bannockburn, often in near tandem. How easy would it be for experienced maritime men to confuse the two? Here's a good example. This is the passing vessel report from the Detroit Free Press, November 4th, 1898. Notice here that the Rosemont is shown as passing at 3.30 in the morning. Yet on the next day, the Rosemont is shown again passing at 11 a.m. How could it be that the Rosemont passed twice in the same day? Well, actually, going through the records, it was the Bannockburn that was the second vessel to pass. It was mistaken for its twin sister, the Rosemount, in broad daylight by the ship reporters. These ship reporters had just one job, spot, identify, and record passing lake boats on sight. If they could confuse the Bannockburn for the Rosemount in broad daylight, so could any superstitious sailor. The bottom line is, that the ghost ship Bannockburn, Flying Dutchman story, is a myth created by Great Lakes writers from a day long past. Authors don't get to do that anymore.